Boom, 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 boom. It's time for Clubhouse Chatter. Can't even do it with a straight face. The guys are rocking and rolling in studio today. Yes, it's Tony Torcato and Norm Ordez. Loving the tunes, man. I feel like I'm at my rave again. I know. The Clubhouse Chatter rave in at 99 Degrees Studio, 98 Degrees Studio. Hey, welcome to Clubhouse Chatter. I am Norm Ordez. That is producer Brian Erickson. Along for the ride is Tony Torcato, the newest member of the Clubhouse Chatter family. Woo. Welcome aboard, Tony. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm getting pumped. This music gets me pumped up. I like it. Hey, our next guest is the first California Angel, Los Angeles Angel, whatever you want to call him, Eli Gerba. Eli, how you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing, I think, you know what? You, they used to say that in 61 and 62, we were crazy, but you guys take the cake. Well, I, don't, I don't know about that. Yeah, you're, you guys are, no, you go right along with Rocky Bridges and the rest of them. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, oh, oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you about Crazy, and it, it was it was probably <laughs> one of the greatest times that we had on Clubhouse Chatter, and it was with Carl Erskine. And yeah. the last time we had Carl Erskine on, he was talking about Jackie Robinson, and Brian was reading an article about Carl playing the harmonica. And we asked Carl if he would bust out and play us a tune, and he breaks out his harmonica and plays no take, it, take Me Out to the Ball Game. Is that right? Yeah, it was, well, and he I was good. I can't do that, and I, I can't sing very well, so, I, you know, we're, 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 we're done there. That's, that's <laughs> I, you know, I can dance, but you can't see that, see? So the very first angel, tell us a little bit about yes, that. Sir. Tell us a little oh. bit about that story. Well, and, well, I, you know, the thing is, is after uh, the 60 series, uh, there were quite a few guys that were very, very angry. And I was the one of them that I didn't get a chance to pitch. You know, and there were two or three names that were like, uh, Whitey pitched two shutouts or whatever it was, and he let them pitch most of the nine innings. I, I warmed up twice. I never got in the game. I pinch ran for uh, Elston Howard one, one, one game. And that was it. I was devastated. And so was uh, Ryan Byrne. Was dev- we had a lot of people on that team that were devastated. But I was, anyway, we had heard about, uh, you know, California, and they were going to have uh, another team and the whole thing. So I got a letter from, uh, I think it was Webb, stating that I may be on the list of 15 players. Well, guess what? I was on the list. And uh, sure enough, I'm home, and they told us, uh, you know, say, you know, it was like the guy's getting drafted now. Stay by the phone. So, you know, at my grandfather's house, we were all sitting around the house, phone rings. And it's, I think it was Fred Haney. And Fred says, uh, Eli, yeah, we selected you. You were the first player selected in the draft. Well, that didn't mean anything to me. It just, you know, I said, oh, man. I didn't know whether I should be happy or sad, you know, going from the Yankees to a new team and the whole thing. But one of the things that I really liked about it was, like, man, maybe I'll get a chance to pitch more, you know. Little did I know I should have been a relief pitcher all the time. Well, he neither here nor there. But it really got to the point where I was a little happy because now uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say I liked the attention. It was kind of nice, you know, the phone calls and and uh, then I talked to him. After that, Mr. Uh, Rigney got on the phone, and then Mr. Autry, you know. So I was I was kind of tickled. I really was. So, And uh, I found out that uh, my roommate also got picked, Kenny Hunt. So that's, you know, that I had a roommate, so that, <laughs> that was pretty good. So you head to California. Yeah, well, Dick Mons and, and who was on the list, too, and Kenny... Both of them, Duke lived in Detroit. Kenny lived in North Dakota. They came to Chicago. I had a brand new 1961 powder blue T-Bird. Ooh. And now let me tell you something about the idiocy of, of a guy that has been known to go out and have a few drinks and chase the girls. And how do you hide a powder blue T-Bird in the city of Chicago on the south side where they have Mm-hmm. Steel mills and after everything else. <laughs> How do you hide when we we all had a 
you know, all had our cars, and we drove to Palm Springs. Well, in those days, as you guys know, Palm Springs wasn't that big. I couldn't hide my car any place. Right. Um, no. So we had to go to a place way outside the city. That type, you know. So, but uh, go from spring training in St. Pete to Palm Springs. You got to be kidding me, man. You got to be kidding me. You know the difference in the. Uh, I don't know, how would I say it? The decor. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know? I lived in Palm Springs. I know about Palm Springs. Oh, I mean Palm yes. Springs. You know, I don't know about now, but when I when I lived there back in 88, 89, man, I thought I was in heaven. Oh, I yeah. mean, just palm trees, you know, palm tree lined streets. Yep. Uh, you know, it was paradise. Why the hell did you move here, Norm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, what uh, are you doing there? <laughs> you know, of course you had you had Angel Stadium there in Palm Springs and yeah. you know, you had one of the most at the time influential um actors around with Gene Autry as your owner. That's right. And you know, and, you know growing think about this think no, just a second. Excuse me for interjecting here. Just think, you said 88, just think 1961. There was hardly anything in that city. Right. Mm -hmm. Apache Junction was like in another part of the country. It was like another, it was way out. So go ahead. You know, tell my dad My dad told, you know, would always tell me stories of growing up, you know, in the, in the 40s and 50s. And, you know, how they'd, you know, they'd watch their movies. They'd go to the movie theater and pop down a dime to watch yeah. you know a Gene Autry western and you know yeah. and a lot of those a lot of those movies were shot outside of Palm Springs in the Mojave Desert That's you know right. whether it be Barstow or outside of Palm Springs or whatever and yep. so i remember you know taking you know taking drives through the desert there and just like I've seen this before, I've seen those rock structures yeah. before, but where you know it is probably yeah. from all those old westerns. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm, I'm I'm quite a bit older than you, but I can remember too. As soon as Mr. Autry got on the phone, all of a sudden, what comes back to me after we got off the phone, you know, and everybody said, "Gene Autry?" And I said, "Yeah, Ma, he's the uh, owner of the club. I used to go on Saturdays for fifty cents. We used to go to the show at eleven o'clock." And get out at five, and wow. it would be like seven. There would be seven uh, uh, cartoons. Mm -hmm. There would be three serials. Uh, guys with uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, oh, the Three Musketeers, mm -hmm. and on and on. And then of course the Notre Hit and Roy Rogers. So we went in at noon. We never got out until five o'clock. Man. And yeah. there's my, you know, here I am now. All of a sudden, my boss is Gene Autry, one of the nicest men you'll ever meet in your life. That's what everybody says. Yes, sir. You know that he was, he was, he was a uh, a player's owner, and you know he was for the players. And you know, I I don't think I've ever met fault. anybody who said that, you know, they've disliked him. Yeah, almost to a fault later on. Later, later on when when he. You know, uh, after the, you know, the 60, after the newness got off and into the 70s, you know, and they started having a hard time and everything else, uh, uh, things didn't go very well. You know, he, some people kind of took advantage of his having money right. and, you know, buying players for, you know, their friends and the whole thing. And I don't have to go into detail, but it's, uh, and then, and he, 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 like I said, he was like a son, not like a father, and a friend. And, you know, afterwards, after I got out of baseball and I was living in Anaheim, I went to work for KTLA. I was over there for two years and worked in production. And, of course, it was during still my drinking days, and I can remember him telling me many times, every time I'd see him, he said, if you should have stayed in the station, you'd have been the program director for sports. That's true. Speaking of the drinking, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> you have you have a new book out. Yes, sir. And it is 
titled The Baseball's Fallen Angel, a major leaguer's, what is it, the major leaguer story of high expectations, hidden pitfalls, and talking, yeah. you know, talking about, you know, the ongoing fight with recovery. And uh, tell us a little bit about yeah. your book. Well, uh, it's it's really and truly how a guy, and it happened so, so fast, uh, went from a number one draft pick, went from a, from from being a New York Yankee, getting in the World Series his second year, you know his second year, or playing with Mantle, Maris, everything else, you know. Uh, my dream, basically, you know, I, I, I they use that word too, but anyway, here I am, a kid out of South Chicago that worked in the steel mills. I was an iron worker during the off-season a few times, and here I am now in California. I'm the number one pick, and in three years, I was gone. And and Bob Lennon said something to me. I don't know if it's in a book or not. I think it is. He, he took me aside one day, and we were talking, and he said, I have never in my life, I've been in baseball a long time, and Bob was quite the drinker, too. Bob was an alcoholic. And uh, Bob, when, Bob says to me, he says, I have never seen anybody lose their stuff so fast in my life. I had never had, I didn't have a bad arm. But the alcohol, they talk about having, uh, you know, some people have an allergy to it. Well, I must have had an allergy to it, too, because it, I could drink and drink and drink and drink and drink some more, and you'd never know it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, 63, and then 63, the Angels got rid of me, which is there was, there was a big story there in 1963. I think you'll enjoy about uh, something that happened in Minnesota. And Rigby had no use for me, no use. Well, I'm a big RA. You know what an RA is, don't you? I don't want to say it on the air. Yep. And, uh, you know, he, that was it for me. So when I got sent out, I just quit. So when I quit, when I say I quit, I quit. Not alcohol. I now my love of my life became alcohol. That's the only thing I knew. I only knew how to play baseball and sports and I love basketball. We used to play basketball every every year I'd come back we'd play at forty games a year, semi pro. And now when I lived out in California all I did was in the wintertime chase women and drink. Hmm. <laughs> Tasted. And who I'm talking to Norm, right? Oh, Norm, yeah. I, I, yeah, I got married in 1962, and I can honestly sit here and tell you, I have two beautiful children by my first wife, nice lady. I don't even know how or why or w- 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 I have no no reason. I don't know. I'm not, you. That's that's what alcohol does to you. Right. Some people differently than others. Mine took me. Some people it takes five years. To be, you know, to really hit them. Mine took me, you wouldn't believe. I had six DUIs in California. Can you imagine that happening now? No, oh, you'd be locked away. You'd be talking to me in prison. Yep. I had four alcoholic seizures. Hmm. That the seizure is where I'm standing at the bar talking and shooting the breeze. I'm fine. And all of a sudden, pow, away you go. I spent three different times in the hospital going in for because I threw up blood and I it came out the other end too. I had a, I came back from 1978 or 777 or 78 to an old Tigers Day game in L.A. and you know still drinking and and uh, went goofy with all the guys and one day we the next day we're playing golf with my good buddy and threw up again you know again and I still didn't think I had a problem I swore to you and there's an old saying I don't know where it came from I never knew I drank until I set all myself sober and that's the gospel truth I had no idea you know you have you have some kind of an idea Norm you know be, you know when when you get in jail you know or, or you get into a big fight and everything else I didn't fight that much when I drank but I always had black times. 
and it was usually when I would lose or I would, uh, even when I played, I'd have my black moments. And if you look at me cross-eyed, I'd say, what the hell are you looking at? What are you looking at? And the guy probably knew you from somewhere. You know, the bartender would say to me, Eli, you know, through your eyes, I don't care. Look the other way. You know, so, I and, and no arm problems. And and uh, I got into his, I got into Rigney's uh, doghouse. I don't know what it was. It was from being a wise ass and not, you know, taking any of his guff. I, I, that was, that was just me, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't right. Some, some of it wasn't right, and it wasn't right for him to, to, to be that way. So, and I'm going to give you an instance. They sent me out in 1963 because of this incident that happened in Minnesota. You don't have enough time for it. And I get sent out, and that's when I really and truly quit. But Fred Haney promised to bring me back. I came back, I think, August 2nd. Rigby called me in his office, and he said to me, he, he would not look me in the eye, which really made me mad. He wouldn't look up, he's smoking a cigarette. And that was Bill. He says, he called me 3-3. Three, three. He said, 3-3, three, three, let me tell you something. You're back here, and I don't want you here. Verbatim. I remember all these years, this the words from this man. I don't want you here. You're not going to pitch. So I would suggest that you have a good time. And I looked right at him, and I said, well, Mr. Reedy, you don't have to worry about me having a good time, pal. I didn't pitch tonight for, I think, once in two months or twice. Yep. Ronnie Klein, who was with Washington, and they were hurting for pitching, Gil Hodges, told Ronnie, do me a favor, see, something's wrong with him because his name came up, and we can pick him up. And Ronnie said something to me. He said, yeah, we were buddies, you know, we were roommates. When he was with the Angels, he said, hey, Grubbs, are you all right? I said, yeah. So what are you talking about? He says, well, the rumor has it that you've got a bad elbow. See what they used to do in the, in the old days? Mm-hmm. They can't do that now. Right. I'm not taking up too much of your time. No, oh, you're fine. You're fine. Okay, well, anyway, okay, well, anyway, I went to grab up. I said, Sadowski, I said, Eddie, come here. And Eddie was mad anyway because he, he wasn't catching either. I said, Sado, come here. I grabbed the baseball, and Martin Bisson said to me, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to throw. They want to see me throw. He said, no, you're not. I said, I'll tell you what, you're big. And I said, we'll have the biggest fight you've ever seen in your life right here in the mound. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he didn't say anything. So I went over on the side in, in, uh, in Dyer Stadium, and I threw to Eddie. And Ronnie said, Eli, Damn. I said, I don't know what they're doing, Ronnie. I have no idea. I don't know what they're doing. Well, I was making (laughs) $16,500. Season goes over. Yeah, season comes over. I think I went to play winter ball that year, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, uh, next year, I get a contract for, you know how much? $7,500, buddy. Oh, wow. Well, I held up. I held out. I got twelve thousand five hundred in one week's time after I signed my contract. They released me. Hmm. And don't get me wrong, I, I I take some responsibility. But he could have pitched me. He could have said, "Well, somebody could use this donkey or whatever." You know, he, we've we've had some dandies. He and I, not dandies, but he was. I didn't like some of those things that uh, that I I did. You know, I was he just didn't like it. He took me out of a game one day in 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 uh, Wrigley <laughs> Field. The score was nine to one in the fourth inning, four and one third innings, bases loaded. He takes me out of the game. Hmm. Now as I'm walking, I'm, I think you know me. You've heard about me and everything else. I. Going down to the dugout, I look up and I see Mr. Autry and I see Andy Dickinson sitting there. Because I always knew where Andy Dickinson was. Oof, Lord have mercy. 
anyway, I come into the club, uh, dug out, and I busted uh, kind of a water pail that had the ammonia water they used to, you know, cool you down and everything else. Yep. And the water went, water went on Autry and on and, uh, Dickinson, which I did not know. And I proceeded to go up the runway, and I beat the hell out of everything I could find. Well, the walls, the, uh, uh, and I got up in the clubhouse, and oh, I'm sitting there, having a beer now, and somebody knocks on the door. I mean, of course, you know, I said, what, what do you want? And of course, there were some uh, invictors in there. And he said, this is Gene, this is Gene. And oh, what's the boss? I open the door and he comes in, you all right? Your head, you cut your hand. I said, so what? I said, I'm lucky that's all I hurt. But I'll keep with it. He says, Eli, you can't do that. So he gets it. Now, now here's, now here's the, my thought process. Here's the guy I remember galloping on a horse. <laughs> and me being about 10 or 11 years old, getting me a beer from the cooler in the clubhouse. And this man and myself sat and he cooled me down and we had about six beers together. <laughs> wow. Wow. So when did you... Yeah, when... How the hell do you take a guy out of a game that, w- w- in 9-1 to one and don't even give it him a chance to pitch five innings? Right. You know. <laughs> when did you start well, getting the help that you needed? I never wanted any help because I didn't think I had a problem, Norm. I swore to you as, as uh, really, I sit here. I, I didn't think I had a problem. Right. I I would I'd, I'd go into the vets, you know, and then the year that I told you I was out in California, I went to the vets, and uh, the guy that was examining me says, you know, you dumb son of a gun, I know who you are, you're going to kill yourself. Your esophagus is going to break and you're going to bleed to death. Yeah, okay. A lady, a lady came in, a nurse, and she says, I have to take some information. Yeah. I said, honest, I'll give it. Go ahead. How much do you think you drink a day? I said, anywhere between a quart and a quart and a half. Now, this is 1977, and just think of all those years that started out in about 1963. I was already an alcoholic when I got out of service. That was 1959. But I wasn't as bad. You know, you progress. And that's the bad part about the alcohol. You know, if you're strong enough and everything else, you you can drink and your glass slowly but surely slips. You divorce and you lose your family. You know, it's slow but sure. And, and like I said, it took me almost 30 years all of a sudden to realize through the grace of the good Lord, you know, my, my higher power, that I was a, I was a bum. I slept on streets. I slept in cars. I slept on the bar stoops in the back with my sleeping bag waiting for the bar to open. Wow. I would wash my hair in the bathroom with the soap in the in the uh, bet, uh, the bar's bathroom. Mm-hmm. And most of this, most of that is in the book. But you know, when people say, "When did you know you had a prop?" <laughs> Just that one day, that one morning at three o'clock in the morning, I got on my hands and knees. I I snuck in. I, I was living in a place in El Monte called out the uh, Wayne Fanning Alcohol Institute. They helped alcoholics, and they would evaluate them and then send them out for programs and everything else. You know. Well, they said, well, you, you know, you're pretty good, Eli. You've got a good job. And I'm saying, he says, how about you like to stay here for 300 a month? Yeah. I'm iron working, and, but I'm drinking. And you're not supposed to. So I used to sneak in the back. Hmm. A long period of time goes on, goes goes by. And now I know I'm, you know, I, I have a feeling that something's really wrong. And I was staying with very, very dear friend of ours, a Serbian family. And got kicked out of her house because she says, I could only handle one alcoholic. Her husband was one. So here I am again, sleeping in, I call it, the Hotel California, my car. Woke up, 
the next morning, embarrassed, shamed, first time for a long time, in El Monte, and I'm waiting for the bar to open at 6 in the morning, pal. I walk in, ordered the beer, and my hands were shaking bad. I grabbed the beer. As soon as I grabbed the beer, I'm fine, man. But see, the beer didn't do it, so naturally I go to my favorite, Vio. Shots of Vio. It's not even 9 o'clock in the morning. I had about $120. Now, everybody else started coming in, all the other <laughs> drunkards. And, of course, I buy. I buy. You know, I had my World Series ring, and they talked baseball. And, and then all of a sudden, I swore to you, I looked down on the table, on the bar, and I saw 20 bucks. That's all. I said, holy, wow. Wow. And Wayne Fanning Place was right down the street because that's where my friend Joe went. The guy where I lived, you know, with his, uh, he and his wife. Mm -hmm. So I left uh, him 10. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get some rest. I'm going to the... I didn't know what the hell. I didn't know what it was. Got in there. They took my belt. They took my ring. They took everything. I said, what are you doing? He said, no, you're not going to work out. This is an alcohol rehab place. I'm not. Yeah, okay, fine. Sit down. I blew in one of those things, 2.6 something. Wow. Yep. And that's not, that was uh, about 1130. Yeah. He said, how long have you been, you know, of course they always ask you, you've had a few, yeah, I had a few. Yeah. I still didn't know I had a problem. I, I still didn't know I had a problem. I swear to you. Until I got down on my hands and knees at night, I came into the room, bombed in my prat, fell into the room. Bidding I was drinking, I thought. And I started to cry. And I cried for about an hour and a half saying, take me, I ain't no good. I talked to God, I'm telling you, I talked, I know, I talked for an hour. Tell him how brutal I was, how terrible. My kids, are, you know, all. Oh. Went to bed that night, I got up the next morning, I swear to you, Norm, I felt something strange happened to me. I didn't know what it was, I had no idea. The guy that ran the place had somebody come and get me, and I went, uh-oh. I got caught probably. I think I'm probably going to get kicked out of here. Still, I didn't know what the hell happened to me. Something happened to me, and I didn't know what it was at that time. And I, you know, I had been to meetings at the, uh, at the facility. You know, I had meetings there. Well, I went to see him, and he said, you know, Eli, I know you've been drinking. Now, this man did not know what happened to me that morning, August 1st, 1981. And he said to me, something told me not to kick you out. Hmm. But here's what we're going to do. What do you do for a living? I said, I'm an iron worker. What do you make? I make 18 bucks an hour. Oh, okay. He said, well, we got a job open at 11 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. You take care of the... What do you call? We we want you because you're you know you're kind of a big man and you know some of the guys get a little raunchy or whatever it is so you can you kind of help the cops and everything else to bring him and I said yeah well how much do you make five fifty an hour I said I'll take it and he said because we were going to kick you out of here but something told me now this man did not know what happened to me that night I had a spiritual awakening I didn't have a drink I didn't want one but one other time during the during my sobriety, in the early sobriety, I wanted a drink because of a woman, you know. Oh, I was crushed. But nothing. But now you got to now you gotta learn how to live, Norm, because all I ever knew in my life, you know, grew up in a, a broken home, uh, abusive father, but had a great family. You know, you know how the Serbians are. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they took care of me. My aunts took care of me. My mom worked. Uh, I didn't see my mom a lot of times. You know, I lived with my grandfather. And they, they you know, they, they took care of me. So uh, it's, it's a weird life. 
<laughs> but I said, only by the grace of God. I tell people, I, I don't, only by the grace of God and my sober, and that's, you know, because people ask me, they remember me when. And I'll tell them, and they say, oh, come on. I said, well, then don't ask me. And uh, it's the best of truth. And they're, you know, they're, naturally, there's a lot of funny stories in there and in the book about Stango. And but I don't want to pick up all your time telling you about a guy that did not know he was a drunk. He had no idea until that. So I got sober. You know, and then he, you, ahead, you have a great story to tell. Because I know, and Tony knows as well, that alcohol runs prevalent in baseball. I mean, there, are, there. I mean, it still does. Does it? It still does. Absolutely. You know, and I, I remember, you know, after games, you know, you go back to the team hotel. It's eleven, eleven thirty. You know, you've got a stack of drink tokens from the bar in the hotel sitting on your nightstand. What do you do? You're not ready for bed. You're not. You're. You're not wound down. Well, pick up those drink tokens and I go to the bar. I go well, to the bar and start drinking and start mingling with people. Mm-hmm. You know. You better remember too. In the 1960s, but I remember when I got out to California, not so much when I was with the Yankees, when I got out to California, we served greenies. All of a sudden, somebody said something about a greenie. Now, I took a greenie in the Army. Right. And we, had a, we had a pretty good baseball team, basketball team in the Army. I mean, a good one. And we were playing Fort Gordon, who had, a, had two guys, Jack Sally, uh, and three guys that played college ball. We had them up by 13 points at halftime. Because you know why? Jim Owens. Remember the picture of Jim Owens? Hmm. Tom Cheney. You know, Mark Brady. We all played on this team. I'm a pretty good team. As long as the Bennies held out. <laughs> we ran out of Bennies. We couldn't jump. <laughs> we couldn't jump a, a half an inch. Right. Just, you know, and that didn't help me either. I didn't take a lot of them. But in August, when you're tired, you know, you, you heard the stories. And somebody said, well, where the hell did you get them? Well, the club, you know, our, our trainer had them. He didn't give them out to anybody. You know, it wasn't like the uh, prevalent, like he just was handing them out. You asked for them. Mm-hmm. And we used to get them from the stewardesses. Yeah. They, you know. Back in those days, and even in the 70s, I remember, um, Tony, you, you probably remember Lynn Sakata. Mm-hmm. From the Giants, oh, sure. and and Lynn yeah. Lynn told me a story one time when he was with the Baltimore Orioles on how, and it was in the seventies, to where he would walk into a clubhouse and they would there would have be Tupperware containers full of greenies, roofies yeah. on the table, and you picked your poison. There'd be red, there'd be yellow, there'd be green, there'd be blue. You choose yeah. your poison, you know, and yeah, that was, was later. Prevalent. Yeah. I mean, in, in I don't know about all the clubhouses, but I'm pretty sure that it was in quite a few of them. And well, <clears throat> see that came later. I, I, he used to have his, you know, in the back. You know, they had two different kinds of green greenies. One that was a double, one with a cross, two mm-hmm. crosses, cross tops, and one yeah. was just a heart shaped one. And and for instance, I took one before a double, double header. And I was kind of late getting into the ballpark, you know, and Dean Chance was pitching the first game, and Dean were fast, you know, and I got stuck in the Hollywood Freeway. We were going in the Dodger Stadium, and then the jackass uh, <laughs> wanted to charge me $2 to get into the park. <laughs> I said, I'm an, I'm an angel. He said, I don't care. I had to pay 2 bucks to get into the ballpark. <laughs> now I'm hot. Get in, and I asked Freddie. I used to go to him. I'd say, Freddie, boom. Okay, Eli. Okay, first inning. Had good stuff first inning. They got five runs off me in the first inning. No, three runs. Before he took me out, I had two men on, and then, of course, they scored. There were two bunts that I swear to you, I want to take, up, I want to take it up, and I didn't see the ball. And I was a pretty good feeling for, uh, pitcher at the time. And if you look at my... My uh, record, 
that one year I had seven errors. Now, I don't know if that was a misprint or not, but that was when the bell call started getting to me. I, I swear to you, two bunts right in front of me, and I went to pick them down, and I went to grab it, and I was about a foot short. Hmm. I didn't see my, I couldn't see it. Wow. Uh, that didn't help either. The, you know, the, the greenies, we call them. Right. No, but see, it was me, it was elk, it, it was alcohol because when I got out, oh my gosh. And then, you know, then 1964, I go up to uh, Toronto, I signed in, Sparky Anderson was there. Now, if you wanted to see a Raven maniac, when before Sparky got a hold of himself, you would have never believed how he was. And even he apologized when he saw me many, many years later. He said, Grubsy, I'm so sorry. I said, well, I'm sorry, too, because I threatened to kill him one day. <laughs> and you saw drinking before the game. Wow. Yeah. Mr. E Mr. Eli Gerba on with uh, his yeah. new book. The Fallen Angel, and uh, you know it's 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 real. I mean, addiction <laughs> is is so real, and you know we've we've had Christian Colonel on a couple of times, and he's talking about yeah. how drinking got the best of him as well, yeah. and he's been clean and sober for I think what close to four or five years now, and so but but yeah. the fight is real. I mean, it continues. Yeah, well, the thing is, you have to learn how to live too. Right. And believe me when I tell you, you know, when people read the book, I'm not proud of what's in there. I, I'm not proud. When I told telling the story, I am not proud. You know, when I when I speak some places, uh, sometimes you know, once in a while I tell them, I'm not proud to <laughs> to be up here. I'd rather not. Right. But I said this is the way it is, and this is how, you know, the man upstairs, God, as I call him, God took care of me. And he did. There's no other explanation, and there's no coincidences. And another thing, and I, you know, I don't want to take up all this. Here. They had so many warnings. Norm. Right. I look back, and I'm blessed. I'm blessed with a fantastic memory. I got so many warnings. You don't know. You don't care because you know what? It's you know. I had a kid ask me one day. He says, "Did you ever go have a beer?" I said, well, what is a beer? He said, you know, just a beer or two. I said, never. I never had one anything in my life. Hmm. I was uh -huh. an addict. All right, Eli. So we were talking a little bit about Rocky Bridges. Yes, sir. Can you can you give us a quick Rocky Bridges story? <laughs> one of my favorite guys in all of baseball. He passed away here. What has been about a year and a half ago, I think, yeah. that he passed away. And um, what what kind of a, a Rocky Bridges story can you take us out with? You got to remember, Rocky Bridges was a shortstop when we first got there, nineteen sixty one. And Rocky was not the greatest fielder in the world. Right. You know, he was. You know, he couldn't. He was in on his way out. Now, and now Rocky, you talk about somebody that could hoist some beer. He was outstanding. I mean, outstanding. But Rocky always had a funny story. He always had something funny to say. We had a golf tournament in Palm Springs, and him and Tom Morgan were buddies. You know, they're the older guys and the whole thing. They played nine holes in less than no, 18 holes of golf in less than two hours. I said, how the hell did you do that? He said, well, yeah, we ran half the way. We <laughs> played. Yeah. And, and you know, he, he had, I, I can't remember so many of the things, that, but he always was upbeat. Right. He used to come to, he used to, come to the park at 2 o'clock, at 1 o'clock in, in the afternoon. You know, and they'd do certain things, and he'd sign the baseball. But, he, you know, that, that was his life. Yep. He, uh, oh boy, I, I wish I could remember some of the stuff. There's just some stuff I can't, you know, not that he did, but he caught other people doing, and, and oh, you talk about teasing and oh, him and Daddy Wags, and uh, oh my gosh, you know, he used to call, he called Earl Clank, 
Hmm. And so they said, what does that mean? That the Earl had hands like this, like steel, you know. Every time the ball would hit his glove, it would go clank. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. You know, the, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. Rocky He's Bridges fine. always, always had Classic. the biggest chew that I yeah. ever seen anybody yeah. ever take. Yep. I mean, his cheek, no joke. So everybody has seen, um, what's that trumpet player's name? Oh, Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong. Everybody has seen Louis Armstrong's cheeks when he when he plays. Yeah. That is the size of Rocky Bridges' chew cheek. I'm not yeah. joking you. No, no. I always. Saw always. I saw it. I saw it. He used to come. He used to chew all the time. He chewed in his, uh, in his house. And he, he chewed. They chew. <laughs> he would start. He would start to laugh. He would start to get boisterous, you know, telling stories. And he would start to laugh. And juice would start to like roll down his chin. I mean, it was it was it was comical. And yep. um, one of one of the best baseball men that I've ever known, hands down. Yes, sir. And so, and, and, and his his uniform his uniform was always was always uh, wet from the stick you know from the stick yeah always you stayed yeah he'd be a third base he'd be a third base you know and it still would be wrong done yep funny funny man but I'll tell you what what a nice 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 man he he was he was one heck of a man I I loved him and I'm not just saying that. How, how could you not like him? Right. Oh yeah. Absolutely. How could you not like him? Yeah. Absolutely. Had a passion for the game like like no other. Oh, yeah. You know. Well, look at how many years he. Look at. I got well, one 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 Rocky Bridges story. He we're playing in uh, let's see where was I Hawaii and Rocky with the Giants. Yep. Oh, yeah, I think he was with the Giants and he's a third base coach. And this, we usually have heard stories like this here before, but he. You know, he's given signs. And the guy looking at him, you know, the Latin kid is looking at him, and he's right. And Sonny Rocky says, hey, time out. And he swear to God, he went over to him and he said, bunt. He screamed at him. <laughs> bunt. Well, you know, the, the, the dugouts and <laughs> Funny, funny guy. Good Lord. How do we find your book? Where Where can we go to buy it? Well, you can send them to if you want. You can send them to me. You can send the uh, a check for twenty six bucks to me, and that includes the shipping, and a nice picture and a and a inscription on the inside of the book. Or else you can buy it through Amazon. You can do that too. So. Okay. Once and, again, uh, Mr. Eli Gerba, baseball's fallen angel, and you know this is a story that you know people people need to hear and it's it's real and you know it's about <laughs> you know addiction and i mean addiction is a very real thing and you know for some of us it's it's easy as heck to not to be able to do something but for others it's it's one of the hardest things in the world to get past it's it's, it's the hardest thing in the world to stand up in front of somebody and everything else and say hey i'm an alcoholic you don't. Who, the hell, who, who wants to admit that he's got a problem? Right. Nobody does. Nobody does. And until you do, well, God, God bless you all. The ones that have problems, because who? Wow. Well, try to help as much as you can. You know, good Lord willing, you know, somebody gets a hold of this book and and that needs it and 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 stops and and listens and you know realizes that they have an issue and. Uh, and you know, I mean, you said it by the grace of God. I mean, there's a reason why yeah. you're still here. Uh, only, no, only by the grace of God. So, only. Eli, and you're talking. Okay, what, one last thing, and I'll let you go really uh, quickly. All right. You're talking about a. You're talking about a guy that had a football scholarship and a part baseball scholarship and basketball that could play all three halfway decent and, and basketball. I love more than baseball. And all of it, all of it went kaput. I went to nothing, you know. I went to nothing. And one time, I made a comeback, and somebody says, "How? Oh, what, you, how what happened to you? You're throwing harder now than you threw before." Don't ask me why. But the man upstairs has given me another chance. 
the day that I pitched in spring training and pitched seven innings against a, a AAA team, also the White Sox, I heard the next day that I was, no, I heard that day that the Chicago papers were talking about bringing me up as a, as a relief pitcher. Hmm. Guess what I did that day? I went out and got drunk and got into the, one of the best fights you'll ever see in your life in a bar in uh, Lake Wales, Florida. That night, with my with my wife and my baby, in a in a in a hotel, hotel. there. That's just insanity. Anyway, wow. Hey, let's do this again soon. Anytime you want, buddy. You got my number. All right. Hey, once again, Mr. Eli Gerba. Eli, thank you for coming on the show and. Uh, you know, you can find Eli on Facebook. Check it out, Baseball's Fallen Angel. You can also find it on Amazon. I highly recommend it. I will be ordering mine very soon. And, um, Eli, you're awesome, and uh, we you, love pal. you. Appreciate and, uh, you know, thank keep you. in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I All appreciate right. it, man. I appreciate it. All right. You're welcome, sir. I didn't sir. talk too much. Oh, you, <laughs> you're, you are fine. You, you did well. All right. All right. Uh, you, guys, you two guys take care and don't be too crazy in the place. All right. Just we take, won't. Take we care. won't. All, All right. right. Once again. All right, pal. All right. See you later. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Mr. Eli Gerba. Man, you know, what a story. You know, and, that, and that's a story that relates. You know, I could think of a handful of guys, you know, that drank a lot. You know, that still do. You know, I have an uncle that's an alcoholic. You know, I don't think I ever recalled seeing him without a beer in his hand. And sometimes it'd be one in each hand. Yeah, there's a lot of addiction out there. I don't know what's worse, that or pain pills or what. Well, you know, I know a lot of people. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and here's my question. My question is, and, it, it, and it's Cal Ripken Jr. Everybody loves Cal Ripken Jr., you know, baseball's Iron Man. To think that he played, what was it, 14, 15 seasons without missing a game? You know, people don't talk about, you know, performance-enhancing drugs with Cal Ripken Jr. And I mm -hmm. don't know, I don't know if he ever took any PEDs or what. I'm just saying to stay healthy for 15, 14, 15, 162 game seasons consecutive <laughs> that's tough huh? how do you do it i mean mm -hmm. you have to have help you have to because you know darn well stay healthy through a 144 game schedule on the minor league level is yeah. tough I mean, you know, uh, eli was talking about uh greenies I, i've taken those before. oh yeah mm -hmm. taking cross tops oh yeah i dump them in coffee and uh, well, they're legal man they're amphetamine. Yeah. it's amphetamine yeah it's you can, you uh, can buy them. You could buy them over the counter at your local convenience store. You um, know the little yellow, little yellow jackets. Well, the ones we got were like from Mexico. The legal amphetamines, cocaine on steroids, slash <laughs> right. get you up, slash see the ball this big. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And three hours after the game's done, you're still up. What do you think, Nodos? But it helps. Nodos and Vibrant. Yeah, I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's not good for you. No, really that much. Absolutely not. But. If you want to not feel any pain when you're throwing, I used to throw hard when I took those, man. But yeah, they 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 help you, but they hurt you at the same right. time. And I don't recommend taking those at all. Once again, Mr. Brian Erickson over there on producer and um, go beefs, as Jim Campanis would say, fight on. Tony Torcado, I'm Norm Ordez. We are Clubhouse Chatter. We are sponsored by Baseballisms.com. If you like my hat. Check it out, baseballisms.com. Baseballdudes.com. To be the best, you must train like the best. Chris Gazelle up there in Vancouver, Washington, our neighbors to the north. And Baseball Pros, also up there from Washington, Mr. Mitch Canham. His dad, Mark Canham, with MDM Designs, does our shirts for Clubhouse Chatter. And we stream live every Sunday, almost every Sunday, at yamhilltoday.com. And if you'd like to sponsor, let's talk normboy18 at gmail.com you can find us on Clubhouse Chatter on Twitter, 1T one one Facebook, YouTube iTunes, MLB.com blogs and that's it, hey we have Emily Wolfson of 
unforgettables.com and oh, there it is. so nice. she does some artwork on baseballs yeah, and so Emily will be coming on the 11 o'clock hour stay tuned thanks for viewing watching listening don't take any greenies <laughs>